welcome sentient beings from all known universes and beyond. It's time to activate your cranial downlinks and prepare to receive a raft of discussion on a cosmic ocean of science fiction and fantasy topics, interviews with local area genre devotees, and insightful prognostication by our soothsayers of science fiction, our forecasters of fantasy, and any other beings that happen to get caught in our gravity well. This is the Galactic Driftwood Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of the exciting and uh, in- interesting and intriguing and sometimes dangerous episode of uh, Galactic Drift. Selling it hard today, Bill. Selling. It. I am you're, over- it. you're overselling it, Bill. I I just woke up. <laughs> I can give you one of those things. <laughs> one. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I am Bill. By the way, I am Linda. By the way, <laughs> Charles. Still, still, Seth, I guess <laughs> that makes me Chris. It does, and uh, by process of elimination, he must be Chris. Yep, <laughs> well, he could be Jenna. Oof, we haven't heard from Jenna yet. Jenna's not, not with us today. No, he's not Jenna. <laughs> no. All right, so uh, on this episode, we're going to be talking about uh, a couple of things Mandalorian, first of all. We wanted to get into that a little bit. And then uh, Chris is going to talk to us about, what was it, 65? 65. It's just the name of the film. 65. New film that's out involving dinosaurs and time travel, I think. Um, And then uh, Charles is going to tell us a little bit about uh, the movie Tetris, which he saw recently. So uh, let's jump right into it. Uh, Chris, why don't you take it away with Mando? Yeah, so Mando season three picks up right where season two left off and, and... Basically, uh, Mando at this point is no longer technically considered a Mandalorian as he's removed his helmet and, uh, you know, amongst others, and he's no longer part of any clan or group or anything like that. So his mission um, ultimately in, in this series is to get to Mandalore and find a way to restore um, his status as a Mandalorian. And the only way to do that is to bathe in the the, I forget what they call it, the waters of something on Mandalore. Um, it's the only way to kind of, it, it's, it's, it's like a baptism, if you will. You know, he's going to get re-baptized. Right. Um, and uh, season three also uh, covers a little bit of, I, I don't know if I'd call it a redemption arc, but, but Bo-Katan, who uh, was introduced way earlier on in the series, uh, was part of a Mandalorian clan uh, that that didn't go by the traditions and, and didn't wear their helmets all the time or anything like that. They could remove it, wasn't a big deal or anything like that. So you have these these factions of Mandalorians that exist uh, in the galaxy right now. And I have um, to say and, that would be yeah. the faction I would be in. Yeah, I agree. I don't. I uh, the other Whatever. one is kind of old uh, old ways of doing things, right? Right. And it's like, I don't want to wear my helmet all the time. Yeah. Not when I eat and whatever. Right. And, uh, yeah. Right. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so there's Bo-Katan and she's got this, um, she, she, she's got her own digs now, if you will. And this, in this really cool, uh, I'll call it for lack of a better word, castle that she's staying at now. Uh, but this season finds that she no longer has a, a group of followers. They've, they've moved on without her. She's no longer their leader. Um, and the reason why is because she no longer had the, um, the dark saber, the, the, the sword. And whoever holds that uh, basically leads that clan. That is their way, if you will. Right. And, she never, uh, and actually, I don't think she ever actually yeah, she, had it. She, she uh, of- I guess, historically... Um, I'm trying to think of whether she had it, she had lost it. And that was the reason why I have to go back and, and like go through the details of, um, who that and originally belonged to, but I thought it was her and it was lost a long time well, ago. Maybe. I've been searching yeah, that, for that, it. That, that's all stuff that was in the clone wars, I think. So, yeah. So, um, but there is a history behind it and I can't recall, but I do think that it's possible at one point she didn't own it. So they don't go too deep into it into this one, but just know that she has that relationship with the dark saber and she doesn't have it. But, um, uh, Din Jin does, uh, the Mandalorian does have it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's this story covers both Mando's journey to getting um, rebaptized, reaccepted into his clan, and then also Bo-Katan's uh, journey in, in regrouping with her clan as well. And how is she going to come back to to rise to power, if you will? Um, and also, it covers a merging of the factions, if you will, bringing them together uh, to retake Mandalore. Because this whole time, uh, the premise of a lot of the the background in seasons one and two is that Mandalore was bombed and it was uh, deemed uh, unlivable and all that kind of stuff. No breathable air, and the the planet's completely destroyed. Um, this season brings us uh, some new realities there that it is not completely destroyed. There are people living there. Um, and so a journey embarks, if you will, to to bring the factions together, to go to Mandalore together, and to reclaim it. Uh, and this strikes some fear into uh, those left over from the Empire that are still roaming around, <laughs> where they're like, we can't let them get back into power because they're extremely dangerous. So, because they're uh, gonna come right for us. Yes, yeah. So uh 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 what's his face? Uh grief? No, is it uh I think grief cargo might be the pirate. I gotta look up uh uh the other guy here. Uh Moff Gideon. So Moff Gideon, if you recall, was kind of uh captured or something like that in the end of season two, and in this season we come to find out that he is not in prison anymore and that he has broken out of uh, a prison so yeah it was kind of weird because i don't remember that scene specifically in season two but that's kind of the premise of it it in season yeah, it, uh, i don't three. remember that happening in season yeah. two so yeah. uh the only thing i remember in uh boba fett uh yeah it could have been boba fett so yeah but either way what we'll be coming to find out is it was under the assumption that he was captured and imprisoned and we come to find out he's actually broken out he's still at large and he's been creating his own army of clones um and uh not only that but uh he's also managed to um uh, get a hold of or manufacture the special steel that uh the mandalorians use the, the beskar. beskar steel yeah beskar um so he's got his own army of clones now like stormtroopers except they all wear beskar and mm. they all have jetpacks now too. Um, so this is kind of brings up the the challenge with the Mandalorians is taking them on. You do come to find out, much like stormtroopers, that most of Gideon's uh, uh, men are just as shitty, uh, and one Mando can take down like twenty of those guys. So <laughs> they're they're harder for sure, um, but uh, there's a lot of battling that goes on for that. So, um, and I haven't talked about Grogu yet. And we'll we'll get back to Grogu here in a minute because I have some thoughts on Grogu in this one. Um, but there's a lot of character development, I think, overall with um, Mando and you know between Bo-Katan and uh, Din Djin, uh, they did a really good job in in bringing everyone together cohesively where it made sense. Um, so the story wasn't just kind of random or anything like that. Everything was pretty much intentional, um, and tons of great uh, space battles. Uh, fight scenes. Uh, you get to see a little bit of different skill sets from everybody uh, that's in the group of Mandalorians. Um, even down to the point where, you know, Bo-Katan at one point has a one-on-one challenge with one of her former, I guess I'll call them lieutenants, where she's got to fight him one-on-one. Uh, kind of a challenge, if you will, for uh, over overpower. And, um, you know, she kicks a guy's butt and it was pretty cool to kind of see two Mandos going at it. And, uh, you know, ultimately it was after that fight that, you know, he basically tells her, look, it doesn't matter if you beat me, you don't have the dark saber, you know, you can't, no one's going to follow your command. And Mando turns around and says, Hey, um, technically, um, in one of the prior episodes, uh, I got my ass kicked and I lost the dark saber and she went in and defeated the person who kicked my butt. And, you know, therefore, technically, the Darksaber should belong to her and hands it over. And he's like, because that, that, that works, right? By your rules, this is how this should work. You know, whoever defeated mm. me has my Darksaber and right. she defeated him. So now it's hers. Right. Um, so he ends up handing over the Darksaber 
and uh, uh, that's how she uh, regains control of her former group. So, um, hmm. we won't listen to you. Here, hold this. We're all listening to you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. Uh, and one of the cool things I- I'll say is, uh, it was clear that it it probably did belong to her before or at least it was rightfully her. So if you recall, Mando had a hard time wielding the dark saber. Mm-hmm. It, it took a certain skill set. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, almost like you have to be attuned with it. Right. Yeah. Um, Bo-Katan had zero issues wielding it. As a matter of fact, when she's, when she's holding it, she's a master of it. And it becomes clear when, whenever you see her handle that weapon, um, she can slice and dice anything. And she, she it's like, it's a feather for her, hmm. you know, uh, wielding the dark saber, so it's clear that, that it was rightfully suited for her. Um, she knows how it works, and she knows how to to, to use it best. Uh, but the Mando also had a couple of cool scenes where he he whips it out and and slices robots in half or whatever, and it's pretty cool. Uh, but it was definitely you could tell it's trying. It's not his. He doesn't reach for it uh, unless he absolutely has to and is out of other options. Hmm. So um, this this season sees us. Having Bo-Katan ultimately end up being the wielder of the dark saber and is the right person to wield it, um, and and Mando, you know, Din Jin plays a key part, and uh, or Din Djarin, I should say, plays a key part in kind of bringing everybody together, um, and ultimately he resigns his faith to um, Bo-Katan and says, I'm I'm a follower of yours, you know, you walk the path I, you know, I would rather walk, and <coughs> that's who I'm going to follow. He gives his so loyalty he over. His uh, no, no. He once he so there is a scene like I mentioned. He, their their goal, his goal was to get the Mandalore and get rebaptized. And he ultimately does do that, and mm-hmm. so from that point on, he's still that's the only way he really truly knows, you know. So in this season, uh, once he does the thing where he where he is now rebaptized and he's got his, uh, you know, he's considered part of the the clan again. He never takes the helmet off again. Mm-hmm. So. Um, he maintains that and, you know, that is, you know, his way of doing things. He's not, he doesn't go by the way, uh, bo clan. So mm. no, we do not get to see his face in this season at all. Do hmm. hmm. you think that the, uh, and this is open to anybody, do you think that's going to change as the series goes along? Mm, it depends. So yeah. the way this season, uh, laid it out is. <laughs> The two factions, at least, that did return to Mandalore and those who take their helmets off and those who don't, um, they they ultimately learned to get along, but there was no driving factor f- to go one way or the other. Mm. Um, and and it was one of those, uh, uh, you know, one of the quotes in there was something of the to the effect of, you know, why why Mandalore failed was because we split off into all these separate factions. We had all these different things. And we weren't. We weren't coming together to fight our common enemies, so we have to be together to be strong, and that's when we're at our strongest. And they prove that. Mm-hmm. Uh, even there's such a, you know, you, you end up with a, a group of 15 or 20 Mandalorians taking on an army of like 50 to 100 clones. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't, I don't see any drive or need for it, um, but it does kind of open up the the door to um, people could if they wanted to, um, especially because the only way for someone who's removed their helmet to go back to that is you have to go and and basically uh, wash yourself or bathe in the waters of this underground place that got buried after the bombing. Uh, Well, they have access to that now. So they, they can um, anyone can go through that if they wish. So that, that door is open. I just, uh, there's no driver for it yet. So I'm just wondering. So Seth, you were sick recently. Let's say you were a Mandalorian. And you're the the tribe that wears your helmet all the time. How do you how do you go through a sickness wearing a helmet? You stay in bed. I mean, if you sneeze inside the helmet, how are you gonna? I have no idea. Yeah. So COVID. If you add on, I have to wear a metal helmet all the time. Yeah. Uh, that would have been <laughs> awful, just so bad. So I will, I will add something there. So they did clarify a little bit as to how some of that works in this season. Oh, all right, because uh, I do think there's a lot of open questions yeah. on that. So 
um, when they are together, um, Bo-Katan asks that question. So um, there's a scene where one of the foundlings was kidnapped by some uh, prehistoric looking flying dragon thing. Okay. Okay. And so Bo-Katan is with them and she, she organizes a group to go take one of the foundlings back and, and rescue them. Uh, during that, they're camping out one night and they're preparing meals around a campfire. And she's like, how are we supposed to eat when, uh, you know, when, when we have to wear the helmet on? And you see some of them like tip their helmet up and like yeah. drink something or shove food in there. Um, but uh, Din Djarin answers her and says, hey, yeah, what we do is we just we go our separate ways and we each find a spot where we can be by ourselves in privacy. And that's where you take your helmet off. Oh, brother. Um so that's that's how they do that and so mm-hmm. you could get through sickness but you'd have to be isolated you have to be by yourself right. you can't do it around others so that that's how that that works for mandos <laughs> uh which again I, I i can see where this seems it is it's silly it doesn't seem silly it is silly um <laughs> so uh yeah so that's where uh um that's where that kind of came in so um <laughs> So we meet for lunch, but we don't actually eat. Right, right. right. You go over there around that ridge, and and I'll be over here, and (laughs) and we'll do our thing, and I'll meet you in 20, right? Right. (laughs) So. um, It kind of makes sharing a plate of food difficult. Yeah, yeah, it does a little bit. Yeah. So uh, you don't share your food then. You don't. (laughs) Makes a lot of different things much more difficult. Yeah. Um, So let's. Well, maybe this is maybe this is over the over the line here, but how do they make love if they got to wear those helmets all the time? They call they it take banging helmets. Off. <laughs> banging helmets, <laughs> which is going to be the name for this episode, by the way. <laughs> oh boy, I love it. Um, so I didn't talk about Grogu yet, and that was kind of intentional. So this this season is less about Grogu, even though, uh, you know, ultimately Din Djarin officially adopts Grogu as his son uh, by the time you get to the end of the season. Um, And uh, in doing so, he also officially adopts Grogu into being his foundling as as a member. So Grogu Mm. uh, now is officially part of the Mandalorians. Does he have to wear a helmet too? Uh, Unclear. That's kind of how it ended. Okay. So uh, it's, it's technically, he wouldn't have to because they're not, they're not, you know, they're not being sticklers about that anymore. It's kind of right? cute. He's got chainmail on. Yeah. So but that that chainmail. Sticklers about it anymore. Yeah. He that's actually season, has right? uh, that season, his, right? Yeah. Uh, Grogu gets his first piece of Beskar in this Aww. season as well. Um, the armor makes him a uh, plated uh, shield that he can wear on his chest. So. Uh, theoretically speaking, uh, Grogu can now take a phaser point blank uh, to the chest and he'll be okay. Nice. Um, so that's nice. Um, but uh, the Grogu, in those ears. I don't know. right? I, I don't know how they, yeah, I don't know how they do it. So, yeah, that, um, they give him a, like a helmet that's got ears out to the side and he's just got to like twist it around until the ears just like <laughs> pop into place, right? No kidding. <clears throat> um Grogu in this season um man how long did he does anyone recall how long he spent with Luke uh training I didn't get was the that, idea that it was that long uh-uh. <clears throat> So what was what was interesting is uh in this in this season Grogu still struggles to really use a lot of his powers um and you really don't get to see him get up to speed with some of it until the last couple of episodes Mm. the last couple of episodes it becomes critical because he actually ends up fighting more or less alongside uh dinjarin uh Mm. mando uh when uh the big battle against all the clones and and uh moff gideon breaks out Mm. um there's a scene where we have the uh those special um guards that are dressed in all the red helmets and the red cloaks uh they carry the big sticks with the lightning ends on them yeah uh there's a scene where uh grogu's trapped in a room with them uh separated from mando and bo-katan and uh, grogu's having to take those guys on by himself 
and he's mostly running around uh pushing things around or whatever and then mando gets an opportunity to rejoin him and then it's just mando and uh groku fighting three of these guys and uh grogu does a really good job in the support aspect of things so in this battle if a guy was going to come up and hit mando in the back grogu would just force push him across the room mm. um and he just keeps interrupting but he didn't really do any uh offensive things right okay. um so grogu ends up being this really good um shield more or less <laughs> um and this uh distract detractor distractor of enemies that are fighting um uh Dinjarin throughout the series so um that was pretty cool sentient, sentient shield yes and yeah, 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 sentient yeah. shield almost so hmm. um but i was i was hoping for more out of grogu um but he does do a lot of things involving the force in the last couple episodes, which also saves their saves their butt in terms of moving yeah. objects at the critical moment um, and also protecting them with a uh, we'll get to the robot. <laughs> uh, uh, also protecting them with a, uh, a force shield at one point when uh, a big explosion happens when this crash occurs and Bo-Katan and um, uh, Din Djarin are about to be engulfed in these flames. And Grogu's with them, and uh, they're bracing for impact and about to be burned alive. And then Grogu does his mm. thing, and then this big uh, shield comes out around him, just this force shield, and the mm. fire just goes all the way around it. And so Grogu holds it there for quite a long time. Mm. Uh, and then in typical Grogu fashion, when the fire was done and, and he lets down his shield, he's like, I got to rest now, and just boop sits yeah. down on his butt <laughs> though it's still you still get the sense that like using the force is still really hard for grogu yeah um as, as powerful as we all probably expect him to be or know that he has the potential of um i was hoping we'd see more growth in that uh out of grogu yeah. and it's still just it's still hard infancy, for him so to speak. yeah still in his infancy so he have a lot of mana yet he runs out of mana really <laughs> right. quick yeah only cast, how long like, does it take him to grow spells. up <laughs> I don't know. He's already been around for a long, long time. 50, so. At least 50 years, right? Yeah. Wow. So, and he's had some training with Luke. So, didn't, uh, didn't uh, Yoda live to be 600? Yeah. 400. Yeah. Something crazy like that. Yeah. yeah. I think 900 years old. Oh. Yeah. Wow. But 900 so, yeah. years old, you reach. Look as good. You will not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, one cool uh, throwback they had is if people remember IG-11, uh, the robot that, that helped uh, uh, Mando in some key critical moments. Uh, I, I, I think that was season one, but maybe yeah. it was season two. Um, it was there's season a return one of because that. he was just uh, fine. The robot was sent to kill Grogu and Mando yep. ran into yep. him. That was in the very beginning. So interestingly enough, uh, what you see here is Grogu um, in a rebuild slash remake of ig11 which they call ig12 uh if i recall and um what happened is uh mando needed a robot to help assist him on getting to mandalore that could do spelunking and all these other things uh he needed a sidekick and uh especially to help protect rogu uh while he was there he didn't know what he was going to come across yet so mm -hmm. um he embarks on um a little side quest to see what can be done to repair IG-11 and bring him back. And turns out that they can't in his original form. Uh, so the mechanic who ends up working on it came up with maybe a little bit of an alternative, which was we can give you the body, but this has been modified uh, to where Groku can drive it. Mm. And so for a little while, this part was actually pretty hilarious. Um, so when they first introduce it, they turn the... Um, uh well i'll go back to one thing so when they first try and rebuild ig 11 um the robot actually goes into terminator mode oh. some old code was still in there and when they flip the machine on it sees grogu and actually attempts to kill him mm -hmm. um so they're like okay this is not going to work like we can't like unless we can get ig 11's true memory chips back like there's no way we can turn this thing <clears> on so that's why it ended up being modified in the way it was and the the uh, robot has a button for yes and no for Grogu. So when Grogu gets in and he starts running around with it, Mando's like, "No, it's too dangerous. He, there's no way he'll be able to drive that. Get him out of there." And uh, uh, 
Grogu starts like moving away from the Mando with the robot already. So he's already kind of mastering it, running around the room, trying to avoid him. He's like, I don't want to get out. And so he kept pressing the button. No. So Grogu's like, no, 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 no. And then when uh, they, so he lets it be. And then when they're walking around in the city, he's like, like Grogu is super enjoying this. So he keeps spamming the yes button. So he's rocking around going, yes, 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 yes. And man, it was just like, I can't, I can't do this. So uh, there's the, uh, for the rest of the rest of the uh, season where uh, Grogu is running around in this robot now, um, there are scenes where he, he, uh, yes, exactly. Um, scenes where, uh, maybe a bad guy was about to strike Mando and, uh, you see this robot ar- arm come in and slam him across the room and Grogu's like, no. <laughs> 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 so that part was pretty good. Um, yes. but yeah, you, you see Grogu, uh, you know, uh, become this, like I said, better companion to Din Djarin. Mm-hmm. Uh, in this season, uh, but with some aided help, you know, he gets a an exo scoot, a, a little mini Gundam that he gets to drive around, um, uh, and and at some point when he becomes separated from it, he's got to start relying on his force powers, and, and that's when they 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 end up in a pinch, and, and he's having to help uh, Dinjarin uh, deal with a couple of the the baddies. So, but overall, it was pretty uh, it was pretty good season. I enjoyed it from beginning to end. Um, you know, I, I think it's the best season so far. Um, and yeah, I loved it. It was a 10 out of 10 for me. It had really great moments in it. Really great fight scenes. Can't can't say that enough. Uh, it even had space pirates. Right. So, yeah, we've seen through, uh, I think it's episode three. We saw the part where uh, IG-11 went rogue and tried to take out Grogu and mm-hmm. and the battle <clears throat> where the space pirates were trying to capture him and uh, Mando and yep. Mando, you know, went to warp speed. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I can call it warp speed, even though it's Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what else you'd call it though. He's got like the special Hyper light. button. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, it looks good. We wanted to, we uh, would have finished it already, but then uh, our our friends uh, Zach and and Mark, uh, who's both have been on the show at different times, um, wanted to watch it with us. So we kind of started over and. Uh, They've been out of town for a week. They went to a Magic the Gathering convention up in Chicago. No, Minneapolis. Oh, weekend. <clears throat> so they're up Mi- uh, Minneapolis. Magicing, having fun. So when they get back, we'll pick it up. I'm looking forward to getting through the rest of it, finishing that up. Well, um, all right. So let's jump into uh, 65. Chris, you want to give us a brief Yeah, overview? so um, 65... Um, stars adam driver so you know we're talking about star wars and you know adam driver played um holy brain fart uh kylo ren kylo ren thank you wow <laughs> i have literally not heard that name in i know <laughs> month for whatever reason <laughs> yeah. thank you so uh adam driver played kylo ren and and uh so this is his return to a sci-fi film if you will and uh it starts out with um him being on this technology technology advanced planet um and he's on the beach with his family and he's talking about having to go away for a couple of years to do a job and they're going to increase his salary um which should help uh pay for medical costs that that exist uh because he's got a very sick daughter um but at the the, the cost is he's got to go away for a couple of years um and uh take a very long space expedition um, I can't remember if it was to deliver some stuff or at least just a, an exploratory mission, uh, but they were going to basically double or triple his salary, which was going to help with his daughter's health care. Um, so that's how the film starts is kind of the prologue, if you will. Um, you know, he breaks it to his daughter. Hey, I've got to go on a trip. It's, it's not because I don't love you. It's, you know, this is for you. Um, and uh, fast forward a couple of years uh, ahead and he's on his way home uh, and uh, the ship and uh, the crew that he's with, uh, he's the pilot. Um, And it seems like he got the shitty end of the stick because the the pilot doesn't get to go into cryostasis. So the pilot is basically awake the whole time. I could see why they would triple your salary at that point. Right. (laughs) Um, So uh, he's got a crew members of, uh, I can't remember. It was like 10 or 20 people. Uh, that are in cryostasis that he's responsible for, that they're coming back from this expedition on. They hit an asteroid field uh, out of nowhere, 
and crash land on this planet. Um, pretty much everyone dies in the crew. Mm. And uh, um, so it was good a job, Adam Driver. Right. Um, well, I mean, you get you're you're sleeping. It's two o'clock in the morning or whatever it is, and an asteroid field. You you hit it and it destroys your ship, and you go crash landing down. Uh, the ship breaks up into a few different pieces, and uh, ultimately, um, he comes to find out that most of the crew uh, did die in the crash um, for one reason or another. Whether they landed in some water or the cryostasis tubes failed and nobody was there to bail them out. Um, he finds one remaining crew member, a young girl. Um, uh, I think her name was Koi. Um, but uh, ultimately, uh, he manages to save her just in the nick of time as her cryostasis uh, unit was failing. Uh, and there's the girl. And so uh, he finds out uh, from this little computer thing that he has that another half of the ship uh crash landed on top of a mountain and if he can just get to it there's an escape pod on it mm. oh wow um and so the movie covers him making that journey with the little girl and also discovering that there's all these crazy dinosaurs running around um uh of t-rexes all of them velociraptors uh everywhere uh that they have to combat with uh to get to the top of this mountain um, and so there's a lot of, uh, hand si signaling, a lot of Adam driver effectively almost kind of talking to himself and trying to teach the girl a little bit of English because there's a language barrier. She speaks a completely different language. Mm. I don't know if it was like Japanese or Korean or something, but, um, he basically tells her, well, lies to her and says, Hey, we have to get up to this mountain. Um, and your family's going to be there. Um, oh. uh, traveling with uh but it was the only way he could convince her you need to come with me we have to make this journey to get to this other end of the mountain so um i think the dinosaurs would have been convincing enough to get me to go <laughs> right you you would think so but she's she's a young girl not really sure. understanding she puts herself in a lot of stupid situations um and uh yeah it was a really really good movie it was short and sweet and to the point and the 65 meaning um is as this unfolds um you get a little bit more uh pressure or uh you know anxiety and are they going to make it to get off the planet because it turns out that asteroid field he he crashed into was actually part of a larger asteroid that was coming crashing down onto the planet oh boy mm. and so he's got this little tricorder tricorder thing or whatever that he was using to kind of help navigate them um and, and can aid them in like perimeter checks and all this other kind of stuff where they where they're camping at night and ultimately uh um it it picks up on the asteroid and is like this is a weird anomaly and as another day passes by it's like uh yeah critical extinction event uh this thing is going to hit the planet in x amount of hours you need to get get the f off um mm. the poor so, dinosaurs they never seem to make it right <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that's the takeaway from this. Dying yeah. So just keep getting the shaft. Yeah. So um, to 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 jump to a little bit of the end and to get to the the reason of the the name of the film was sixty five is to reference sixty five million years ago. This was actually um, an advanced uh, um, uh, human race on another planet that crash landed on Earth. 65 million years ago I see. um and witnessed the uh the asteroid uh slamming into the planet and completely re re uh, shaping the landscape and, and causing the extinction event mm. um and what was really cool is when you get to the credits of the film it actually shows some of the scenes where he was at and how that developed into the cities and the towns and the mountains and stuff uh huh. they do this kind of weird montage of stuff uh yeah. to kind of show how things evolved over time um, which was kind of cool. Um, huh. Some interesting things that happen in the film. Spoiler alerts, as always. Um, one of the sad things, uh, which uh, Jeannie and I w w watched it last night, um, we put it together pretty quickly, or at least at least I did, in terms of um, why... Uh, so after the crash landing, and everybody was dead, Adam Driver was contemplating 
not sending a distress call and just ending his life right there. Like no mm -hmm. one's going to find me. Who knows how long it's going to be? We don't know how far he was from home uh, other than he was on his way back. Um, and at one point he gets out his cool little laser cannon. That's what I'll call it. Uh, and is looking at blowing his head off. And then he decides not to. Um, what I was starting to wonder is, was his daughter still alive? Mm -hmm. She was sick when he left. Oh, right. And why wouldn't he want to continue that journey? Why wouldn't he fight to get back to her? Well, right. we've come to find out that as uh, he was traveling with a little girl, he had all these um, messages that were being sent to him over the last couple of years. And you can see her health decline, mm -hmm. ultimately to the extent where you find out that she did, she did pass away while he was gone. Oh, wow. So he struggled at first in the beginning of the movie, even wanting to have the will to live. Mm -hmm. And when he comes across the little girl, um, I, I got something about her made him think of his own daughter. Mm -hmm. And so he did everything he could to try and save the girl. Yeah. Gave him a new sense. purpose. Yep. Nice. Yep. Oh, Makes good. Sense. So you, so th two thumbs up on it. Yeah. I'd give it two thumbs up. I, I don't think the movie got really great reviews, but for something that wasn't dragged out unnecessarily to like two, two and a half hours or something, yeah. the movie was, was well paced. I mean, All right. it, it was fine. I thought it was great. It had action. It had dinosaurs. Who doesn't want to? I know have right? dinosaurs. Yeah. So uh, it was very cool, and uh, um, you get to see him leverage technology against dinosaurs and stuff. But it, you know, it wasn't all gravy. <laughs> Some of those things were tough for him to kill, especially the T Rexes. You get multiple. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> so uh, that that part was pretty cool. You get to see him taking on taking on some really big dinosaurs, right. uh, one on one for the most part. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I, I thought it was good. Two thumbs up. Nice. All right. All right. Well, let's, uh, jump over to Charles. Charles, uh, seen the movie Tetris recently. Yeah. It's on and, Apple TV. Yeah. What'd you think of that, Charles? Oh, well, well, for me, it was, I, I, I knew, I, cause I, it was my college days when, at least when I was exposed to the Game Boy, right? You're a little faint, Charles. Oh, oh, that's oh, better. You're good now. All right. Nope. Uh, well, the, well, the movie takes place in 1988. Okay. So, and that was, and I went, was my, I graduated in 90. So the Game Boy comes out around in the, in the early 90s, right? Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Uh, yeah. About, or maybe late 80s. But the, the movie is in 1988. And it's about uh, this H Hank Rogers of Bulletproof Software, who at a, at an electronics conference, bumps into the Tetris game. He was trying to sell Go or something. Okay. But and he buys the rights to. Uh, I think it was. It, it gets interesting to what's a computer and what's an arcade game and what's uh you know they 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 manage to get into the minutia of that in this. But um, he buys the rights to. I think it's the arcade games in Japan, and then slowly finds out he didn't really have the rights, Ooh. and that he had been taken. Oh, yikes! Uh, by uh, it's the Mirasoft guys. Uh, there's a uh, your typical um, who would be an American villain and his son, okay, you know, okay. father and son <laughs> issues. Uh huh. Gotcha. Um, who are doing dealings with Russia, pretending they're going to pay Russia money, but not because Russia's communist and they can't accept your money anyway. <laughs> and, and so, and now it becomes a race to see who can um, who can get the programmer and the Russian. There's a Russian government-owned. I don't think they ever quite. It's Elorg. I. It's some sort of software company for the Russians. Um, it's between him and the Mirasoft guys, and Russia's falling apart. And the KGB actually, they kind of hate the programmer, and you got a KGB <laughs> agent that's on the take. And at any moment, they're all going like him, and even the Nintendo guys are going to end up being arrested because they're on visas, they're not really meant to do business there. Uh huh. And so it's fun, it, yeah. it's a little cartoonish to carry. But as far as I can tell, the real life characters like the the, the Maxwells, the Mirsoft guys, 
are kind of they're I mean they they really were cartoonish people. Right. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I think they probably did an okay job portraying them. It just it uh but no I I had fun. To me it was it was a lot of fun. There's a lot it goes into quite a bit about um which I was surprised they went into actually but how because everybody wants a piece of uh, like one company will buy the rights for the handheld, one company will buy the rights for the computer, one's for a console. Oh, how and all then, the deals are made. Okay. Right. But then the the contract with the Russians was for computer rights because the Russians don't know what a console or a handheld or an arcade game is. Uh -huh. Right. So, uh, right. so that became that became one of the issues was okay we have to redefine for the Russians what they actually sold. Mm -hmm. um, but it's and, and, and there's some funny moments where like one of the KGB guys has the it was a Russian that programmed the that made the game okay. on like an old uh, Apple looking you know it, but yeah just the one color monitor right. <laughs> Um, and it wasn't even, it only could do dots. So he did it with parentheses. Oh. Whole thing interesting to me. Parentheses yeah. it would rotate and, huh. rather than having blocks. Yeah. But you know, there's a point where like the KGB takes him aside and he's like, you know, I like to do you in because you're, you're the guy that's destroying our country. Hmm. Uh, like, huh. How am I destroying your country? He's like, you're the guy that's causing all these other Russians to waste their time at the office. Playing your game rather than working. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you <laughs> shed some light on it because I was conf I, I was I didn't I don't know the origin of of Tetris and how they came about right. and why you know in some of the previews for the film it seemed to be like there were some global powers at play here between Russia and the U.S. And yeah, they, Japan they play and it up. I mean, it goes all the way up to uh, Gorbachev. I mean, is this supposed to be? Um... It, a bit based in fact, or it is based in fact. Oh. Yeah, it's based in okay. fact. It's fun. It's a I, biographical. I there's a, there's a little bit of reading in between the lines. I I, I I suspect you know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and there's a lot, of, and he's taking on the Russians, and of course they have it set up so the Hank Rogers is somehow he's going to be the good guy. That I mean, you know that through the whole thing that wins. But, <laughs> right. Uh, so you give it two thumbs up. Yeah, I think especially if you remember Game Boys and such. Right. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, and they went a little bit into you know, uh, be, he, I don't think he used the word tetrasized. I was watching it because I remember it was actually Tetris for me, but my my own little personal venture in life is I had friends that had Game Boys in college. Uh -huh. And I sat and played a game, the Tetris game, for a couple hours, and then couldn't sleep that night because all I could see were the damn blocks. <laughs> right, it scared the hell out of me. Actually, I mean, other people seemed to love it, but I went back to them and I'm like, "What the hell?" You know, I got, I'm not touching that game again ever. And he's like, "No, you're supposed to love." You know, it's like alcohol. You're supposed to love it. It's uh, that's what being tetrasized is, and I'm like, oh, dude, I'm done with games. <laughs> that's funny because the weekend where I needed my sleep too. You know? One one of the previews talked about that. All I see are blocks in my sleep. You know, yeah. <laughs> traumatized by Tetris. Oh, well, that's what I know. That's what happened with me, and it and it was, and it had to have been because the way I remember it, it was in color. But now that I think about it, it was on a Game Boy. Yeah, and, for, for um, you, Charles, this might have yeah. been a horror film. Close. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. It was just. I, it was a deciding moment where mm. I went. I, I'm going to take during my college days anyway. I'm going to take a step away from video games for a while because that did. I had never experienced something uh, causing me to not be able to sleep all night because I'm seeing blocks fall from the sky. <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile, right. Meanwhile, in uh, in North Platte, uh, Seth was, had bought his first Game Boy with uh, with money I made delivering newspapers, 
And I didn't mind staying up all night just playing <laughs> Tetris when I could see the blocks falling. Right. Nice. It might just be a little different. I I, I, I I sort of think it's just a slight difference in age. It was all it all it takes with that is yeah. I hadn't been it's just like now the kids with I I'm sure there's stuff with these games that they're playing now that would drive me nuts and <laughs> Yeah, no doubt. You know, but if I had been their age, I'd have been fine with it. Like yeah. I, I played Space Invaders and Pac-Man all day long, you know. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah. Yep. When, when I started like seeing the game at night when I closed my eyes to go to sleep, I was like, uh, or like now I I know that that's when I need to back off the game <laughs> just a little bit, give myself a couple days. Right. All right. I would say the only negative, I don't know if it's really a negative, it seems like I've seen a lot of films where people are escaping just as the country's falling apart. Yep. You know, and the KGB's after, the terrorists are after them, and they get on the plane, and it's just in the nick of time. Yeah. And this is one of those also. Huh. <laughs> where it's just, you know, almost luck that they avoid capture by the KGB. Well, mm -hmm. all right, cool. And uh, that that uh, it's still fun. Yeah. But, all right. And, cool. Well, thanks. For still, yeah. Still, still two thumbs up. All right. Good. Awesome. We'll we'll have to definitely check it out for sure. So, all right. Well, thank you guys for uh, giving us updates on those and a little summaries. And uh, I think we got uh, three things we got to get through now. We got to finish Mandalorian, get on sixty five, and check out Tetris. So. Cool. Man, I got 18 things I got to watch. Yeah, yeah well, get yeah, to it. Like, get to it. Up you your were binge like game. Sick for six weeks. So you got some catching up to do. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> 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 yeah. What are you going to do? I, I, I don't know. I'll start trying to watch stuff in my sleep, maybe. I just. There there you go. Go. Coming out. What do we need? That that's what that's gonna be the invention that, that retires us all. We gotta come up with a head unit that yeah. that projects things into your mind while you sleep. Yeah. Uh and kind of brings you up just outside of the REM cycle where your body could sleep, but yeah. your brain can keep going if you want. Well, they, they've had in the news where uh their uh AIs making inroads into reading minds. How long before it can start putting stuff in? Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. A future show topic. All right. Well, thank you all for watching. Uh, have a great week, and we will see you next time on the Galactic Driftwood. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we're <laughs> professionals. That was, that the was timing of that seamless transition into our outro. One, one take I predicted. My we only ever we only ever need one take. And <laughs> scene. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Galactic Driftwood Podcast. For more information and past episodes, please visit our website at galacticdriftwood.space or subscribe to us on YouTube. And now, please deactivate your cranial downlinks, collect your towels, and be sure to watch your step as you exit our gravity well.